Thank you. Is this on? Hello, everyone. Um, great. It's pretty spread out, uh, but that's how it is. We will have um, Sivan, my colleague, uh, running around with a microphone if you contribute, which we really would like you to do. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit, but yeah, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Astrid Nimmelin Karlberg, and I work for Open Forum Europe in Brussels. Um, we have been around and active in Brussels for maybe 17 plus years, something like that, working on openness in um, the IT markets. Uh, so some keywords there would be open source, open standards, and of course, interoperability. Uh, and next to me, I have Vittorio Bertola uh, of Open Exchange, um, our co-host, uh, Vittorio. Yeah, I'm Vittorio Bertola, and many of you know me from previous incarnations since it's, I've been in this environment for 20 years, and I'm actually one of the people that were responsible for inventing the IGF, so I take the blame for all this stuff, which is still going on after 15 years. But I'm here uh, at the head of, as the head of policy for Open Exchange, which is a leading German European free software company making email and DNS software, and as such we are interested in promoting the open source idea and the open standards, which is what this will be about. Yeah, and uh, this this topic of, of um, uh, interoperability, it happens, it's in the context of something that's really, of course, as we all know, moved up on the political agenda, and it's uh, the competition or perhaps the lack thereof in the digital markets, uh, and in particular for the platform economy. And for this conversation and discussion, um, we would like to focus on interoperability as a possible solution to, to increase uh, competition. And to some extent, we feel like uh, the topic of interoperability has been slightly overlooked in the policy debate for the last few years. Um, and the idea of it, essentially, to for the ones who have not engaged with this before, is that an interoperability requirement put in place by uh, law or perhaps through standards organizations um, would put in place for large platforms um, um, it would enable other new competitors to enter the market um, and kind of turning the network effects it's kind of considered like a judo move on network effects so the idea is that you lower the barriers of entry by being able to compete um, with at different levels of the uh, the large platforms um, and having more, you know, lower, lower the barriers of entry into the market uh, will then um, um, allow more competitors to simply fairly compete. And this in turn unleashes societal benefits such as user choice and control. Um, so the idea is that the user does not have to get access to every single platform um, and we would wi avoid through this these uh, winner takes all outcomes. So. While I made the point that interoperability might have been a bit forgotten in the competition debate, uh, we feel like there's more and more uh, conversation around this. I guess it's the further the debate and conversations have happened on a political level, um, they kind of started to realize, many policymakers, that um, it falls somewhere nicely in between as an option, between on the one hand, uh, let's say, just regulators monitoring the societal costs of, of uh, uh, market concentration uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you would have, let's say, a breakup which, of the big companies, which is really very much the nuclear option. And then somewhere in between there, you have the idea of interoperability requirements. However, these are both legally and technically a bit more advanced, and that is why um, Open Forum Europe really wants to kind of take the temperature. To get, I think oh, oh, we have discussed this now for many months, but we really wanted to use the, the IGF and see if there's, you know, what is the temperature on interoperability? What are people talking about? How, what are people thinking about? Just both in terms of opportunities and challenges. This ranges from the technical aspects to the legal aspects, of course. Um, so, in terms of format, um, this is a bit of an experiment. We started off, uh, this was planned as a uh, kind of a pre-event session and kind of information gathering and we decided to keep it as such even though our main session was not approved. Um, and um, we're not here necessarily to argue a particular position. As Open Forum Europe, we think that interoperability is extremely important and it's often 
something to strive for. Um, the question is really like how should it be put in place, what kind of tools, um, what strategies should we take from a policy per perspective, etc. So hopefully um, we hope that you feel up for the challenge of both asking questions, giving statements and ideas. We have prepared a pretty long se uh, set of questions that I think will, uh, that are really interest us, that we think some of them range from, you know, pretty straightforward, but um, perhaps more politically sensitive to some being quite technically challenging. And it's, uh, uh, it's very important to get as much input as possible to really push the, the debate and conversation forward. Um, yeah. So we have quite a lot of time allocated, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, but um, you know, feel free, and as you said, raise your hands. If you want to add something, please state your name and the organization you represent, and Sivan will run around with a microphone. Um, Vittorio, maybe you want to open the floor with some of the first questions. Yeah, I will start with a first set of questions, and then, as I said, uh, we hope that you have ideas on this. If you, if you come here, we, we uh, expect you to at least have an idea of what the problem is and to ha have some thoughts on why it is important. So be before introducing the questions, actually, I would like to I mean, throw some meetings, <laughs> put, put some uh, context maybe and help you, uh, because I don't know how many people here are technical or non-technical, how many are familiar with the issues. But uh, I, So I would like to start with a clear example of what interoperability means and why it makes a difference and it's an example from what uh, from something that we all use uh, every day which is the internet communication mechanisms uh, but I, I think that uh, you, you have to understand the difference, uh, and you can clearly notice the difference between the two main types of communication we make over the internet. One is email, and the other one is instant messaging. Uh, because, I mean, if, if you look at email, email is one of the original, let's say, standards from the original uh, internet. Uh, I mean, early forms of emails actually have, have been existing since the 70s, uh, since when, I mean, the, the proper internet actually did not really exist any, uh, uh, yet, but uh, the, the first uh, attempts at interconnecting different networks started. And email has grown since the 80s thanks to uh, open standards. So uh, the standards are open, you can implement them, and all the, the different people, different services that uh, implement the standards can talk to each other. And so this is why even today, even with, if there is already a lot of concentration going on uh, in, in the email space with uh, Gmail having the, the lion share and over one billion uh, users, still today email is pretty much distributed and there are thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of different email services around the world, uh, different uh, servers. We calculate over 4 million installations of Dovecot, which is one of the software we, uh, free, free we make and which is included in every, basically every Linux installation. So, I mean, I think there are at least uh, several million servers and, uh, around the world. A and so this is uh, really opening up uh, uh, possibilities for new services and new developments, extensions to the technologies, and in the end also opening up a choice for the users. Then when, when the instant messaging systems came, uh, it was already the age of the commercial internet, let's say, after the first uh, dot-com bubble and uh, wave of IPOs and people jumping into this to build big companies, go IPO and become rich. And so, of course, uh, uh, there are and there are still today open standards for instant messaging, but many companies that entered this space just wanted to build their world garden and own their customers. So people stopped being users of open standards and started being customers of a closed service. And ironically, these services that we all know, like uh, WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, I mean, there's lots of applications. Uh, some of them are actually more open, some are less open, but still all of them are walled gardens, are, are silos. So if, if you have a, if you want to communicate with someone on WhatsApp, you need a WhatsApp account. And if you want to communicate with someone else on Facebook Messenger, you need a Facebook Messenger account, even if they are run by the same company in the end. So uh, th this is very inconvenient for users because you need an account on each and every service, but it's convenient for the people that run these silos and can profit by monetizing them. Uh, so even today, you can try to start up a new inter instant messaging application, maybe even better for the users with more privacy protection, I mean, real privacy protection in terms of uh, the, I mean, the, the, the ownership of the service. Uh, but uh, no one will use it because all your contacts are already on other services and, and you cannot uh, communicate with these other services. So this is what interoperability would be useful for because if all these, these services were forced to interoperate, to let people from other services, other messaging applications, communicate with their users, then all of a sudden you could have competition because you could build a new messaging 
client, a new messaging application that would allow you to exchange messages with people on WhatsApp, with people on Telegram, with people on Facebook Messenger. And, uh, and so, uh, actually, it would be possible for new entrants to start new products, so maybe better for the users. And it would be user uh, possible for users to move. Uh, so this is what we are talking about. We are talking about basically reinstating the original principles of the internet, which are about really about openness and interoperability, and which are the ones that uh, enable the internet to grow and to bring uh, a lot of uh, good things to everyone around the planet. So this is my take on the on the issue. But uh, now I, I would really like to encourage people in the room to speak. So the first question is uh, basically, what do, do you mean by interoperability? Especially the concept that has been mentioned uh, in, in some of the papers, some of the discussion, is the so-called adversarial interoperability, meaning that it is a form of interoperability that has to be imposed upon these companies, even if they don't accept to do it. So, of course, uh, I mean, the, the owners of these services could just decide to open up uh, the interoperability and allow other people to communicate. This was partially true because it's a very common strategy, by the way, for these uh, new services to be open in the beginning when you need to build up the user base and then to close down the service once they get to the critical mass. And, and so the, there are still some of these services that allow you to, for example, build third-party applications uh, against their, their, their platform, but they are strictly limited because they are only allowed by the owner of the service uh, as far as the, it is suits their business interests. Uh, the concept of ad adversarial interoperability is rather than there is a regulation or some kind of norm that requires all players to be completely open, at least in, in a set of basic features, and allow all different applications uh, to interoperate and, and uh, offer the same basic features to everyone, uh, independently of wi which client they are using. So, uh, one another is point that uh, we would like to discuss is how is this different from the data portability I mean, because we already have data portability provisions in the GDPR, in Article 20. Uh, the point about uh, the GDPR data portability is that it's, it's really conceived for porting out data from when, when you leave a service. So I, I don't want to use, let's say, Gmail anymore. I push a button, I get all my data, and I can import them into a new email provider. Actually, the, the, the law says that you should be able to do this automatically. And as of today, no one has really implemented this. So already getting this implemented would be a good step forward. But this is not enough, really, if you want to create competition. So uh, the, the important thing is to actually stress the difference between proper interoperability, interoperability which is real-time interconnection between the services, and uh, the data portability, which is good, but not enough. And uh, Especially, we would like to be interested, if, if, you, if you have any, uh, in examples. No, I mean, so it'll, um, if you've seen changes in, the, in, in this environment, if you've seen examples of people trying it, uh, we are uh, interested, since there are, there are going to be people from all around the world in, in examples, in experiences on this, or even in thought exercises on this. So, and uh, then the, the point, I mean, we will get to this maybe in the, in the latest, in the other parts of the discussion, but the, the, the focus of this, this is also how do we get to an agreed definition of interoperability? Because it's easy to say, yeah, we want to open up. And the point is, if you want to bring this up by regulation, you have to have a very precise definition of what do you mean by interoperability. And this is also a discussion that we need to have. So we would like to hear uh, views in the room from people that, I mean, first of all, if you share the views, so if you think that this is important, and then if you have comments on what it is, how can we define it, and how can we bring forward. So please don't be shy. <laughs> Hello. Um, I think one of the main ways to get traction on interoperability, which I think Sorry, is... Sorry, can you introduce yourself and the organization? Uh, sorry, yes. Hi, I'm Christian Bogodai. I work with PolyPoly, Poly, which is an effort to build a decentralized private data storage, where the idea is and to have an interoperable data store for your own data. And the gist here is it is important that we have an economic incentive for companies to be interoperable. Because if we don't have that, there will always be a resistance. Um, companies that have an incentive to be not interoperable, making more money by being a closed silo, will never open themselves up. 
they, even if we have laws or regulations, they will try to undercut those, uh, fulfill them in the minimal way to just get by with that. If we have instead an economic incentive that being interoperable, having access and free uh, of, of your option for customers to freely move around and be interoperable with other services, then this will be a success. Otherwise, it won't be. Do you have any ideas of what that, that economic incentive could be? Uh, is it tax structure? What are, you, what are you thinking? Like, I could go into the sales pitch right now. Uh, I don't want to hijack that here. Um, but it's basically um, we need to reduce the running costs of storing data and being closed and make it economically vi viable to share data and have uh, enable business models that rely on data not being in a closed silo. Uh, Andrew Campling, 419 uh, Consulting. Um, so j just considering the interoperability, uh, it strikes me one of the challenges for, certainly for messaging, uh, is uh, companies that l claim end-to-end -end encryption might cite that as a barrier to allowing others to become involved because it would breach their control and trust uh, of the end-to-end -end, uh, encryption. So I could see that being used as an objection to uh, portability. Um, but as an example of where I think uh, good practice exists, uh, certainly if I look at uh, how open banking's been implemented in the UK, uh, where you have a clear differentiation between the sort of front-end apps that provide the interface to the user and the back-end apps that the various banking providers use to operate the uh, accounts. And clearly they, that can be the same institution at both sides of the equation, or it could be, uh, in some cases, a third party that specializes just in the front end. Um, uh, the advantage that gives is, is it does encourage a lot of in innovation, um, but the, that's been brought in uh, because it's mandated through law. Um, and I suspect that's probably the answer to the question, which is if you want uh, uh, interoperability, then you have to have tightly defined laws to require it. Um, uh, the only caveat to that is uh, I think you do need to allow some reward for innovation. Um, so it would be a real shame if uh, new entrants come in uh, with innovation and then large established companies can somehow um, you know, leverage their innovation um, uh, and, and the, the new entrants don't get to, to actually get the, the advantages of that. Yeah, a, qu a quick thought on that. Uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, there's been some proposals in, in the debate uh, by some academics where um, essentially the idea would, would not would be not to have, let's say, an across-the-board interoperability requirement. So it would uh, land on, and here comes another definitional challenge. It would land on the so-called the large platforms or the incumbents, which, uh, at least in the uh, European context or the EU context, it's been quite the challenge to actually pin down a definition that uh, would capture these services. But uh, the idea then would uh, essentially be that it, you know um, the option of picking, let's say, an encrypted or a more privacy-focused uh, messenger. Um, would not be undermined by, let's say, one of the large platforms or large uh, messaging services to go in and adversarially uh, interoperate with this service, but it would work the other way around instead. Uh, There's potentially one, one challenge, but again, a new definitional challenge arises in that context again and makes the law more complicated to write, of course. Um, any other thoughts or... Sivan? Hi, uh, Karen Riley, Status 404. Um, I come from a tech background, and I um, am an advocate for open source um, in order software freedom in itself is the thing to, to support. However, I think it's important, especially talking about the internet giants in California um, and the human rights implications of having technology made by non-diverse teams, um, why do we want interoperability? What are the human rights harms that we're talking about? One of the things that I focus on is platforms that make it easier for stalkers to find victims, platforms that make gender-based violence online easier, that don't have blocking, muting, and abuse 
uh, reporting mechanisms. So especially in the European context, how can we create better alternatives given European tech's abysmal record on gender diversity, racial diversity, um, the type of people who intuitively know what sort of threat models end users face. So I think it's important not just to talk about open technology standards, but where do we want to go with these standards and what kind of teams, what kind of organizations do we need to build on a social level to have these discussions be fruitful? Do you think um, perhaps that, um, of course, the discussion then to make sure that that is an inclusive discussion when we talk about, let's say, if it's a legal strategy into putting this in place, but uh, would you say that, let's say, a more open and interoperable system could potentially enable uh, more groups that have been kind of excluded from the technical uh, uh, development, perhaps because of network effects, et cetera, and the, the already established incumb incumbents, that this would open up opportunities for them to enter the markets, let's say, with their technology or alternatives. Perhaps that is a, a positive opportunity. One of the other things um, that is lacking in some open source activism communities is a focus on usability. So there's a lot of federated social media projects, open data projects, but unless you're a systems administrator, you are not going to be able to deploy them. And if you talk to hacktivists, sometimes the answer is, well, if you really wanted privacy, you would be able, you would use this command line utility to communicate with only other hackers. Um, and saying that usability is security is one of the, one of the things that um, a lot of people are discussing and it's met with a lot of resistance. And so that's one of the components that whether you're talking about end users, marginalized end users, or enterprise environments, you're not gonna get uh, adoption unless you have graphic designers, UI, UX people in the room as well. And a lot of the times, those are gonna be more diverse groups whose work is not valued in the so-called hard, you know, serious tech world. Yeah, and by the way, the, one of the reasons why the big internet platforms became big is exactly because they were pretty good at user experience and uh, this kind of stuff, which the techies with a, with a mission usually, usually are bad about. So yeah, so it's, yeah, I agree. I mean, in the end, uh, I, I also say that the reason why we wanted to propose this as a regulatory problem is that uh, I still think if, if you make the best possible new competing uh, application completely open and with a great user experience, it will not go anywhere if it cannot interoperate with the users that are on, on the mainstream platforms. And I think this is one of the problems, even of the less bad, let's say, social media alternatives like Mastodon or so. so it's Any other thoughts or ideas? Remdish, hello. <laughs> I'm with the Open Tech Summit here. And uh, I was inspired by this uh, contribution um, on the diversity and the more non-technical aspects of interoperability. And I'm really a great supporter of this uh, European approach of a European interoperability framework because it expands in all these other areas like supporting language diversity, which is a huge issue. Or when you think about UX and UX design, um, often it's overlooked. What do you do when you deal with um, uh, with different typefaces? Um, like when I try to get into the U.S. using the waiver uh, visa waiver channel, um, I had to provide my personal data, my name, and my name includes an accent, and it was not eaten by the system uh, that serves like 16 million people per uh, per year. And uh, yeah, then, then I tried, uh, had to try the same with the name of my parents, Günther and Erika. And Günther is written in German with an umlaut. Also, the American system doesn't accept this. And this is like a mass system, and you can see this in so many applications that we have like these interoperability issues also on a cu cultural level, like you don't understand the software, you don't understand the navigation, and uh, it doesn't process your language, it doesn't process your way of handling it, or it's not accustomed to uh, your red-green blindness because no one in the team who made the software had red-green blindness and understood that this issue would arise. But um, 
coming back to, to the requirements. I, I think this European interoperability framework is really very useful, but still there's also international regulation. When you could, think could you perhaps give a little bit of background on the EIF? I don't know if it's a pretty specific EU oh, document, I, I something it's, just it's super widely, quick. widely known in the, in the interoperability community because it was like part of a very substantial struggle between Microsoft on the one hand and uh, like sort of free and open advocates on the other hand, but that's a long time ago. Um, but in essence, um, it's a framework where the European Union first tried to define what are open standards, a phrase that's used very often, and then try to define the levels of interoperability, the characteristics, the dimensions to look into, like that there should be something like semantic interoperability, technical, legal aspects, organizational aspects even of interoperability. Because mostly when member states of the European Union with their diverse IT systems cooperate in e-government, they have to s overcome these interoperability challenges because all systems are different, um, grown from below, and now they come together on the European level and try to uh, exchange data, um, harmonize their systems. And this cannot be done top-down. Uh, there's also very much a button-up button element to it. Um, but let, let me go back to this, this interoperability challenge. Of course, there are also these global approaches, and one of them is the trade channel, like the VTO. And we have the VTO TBT, uh, Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, that's very influential in the standard sphere. And when you look what was decided in, in Europe on standards on the official level with the standards regulation, it's very much inspired the criteria from the VTO TBT, but uh, an agreement that was probably doesn't reflect that much the internet age and the specific requirements with web standards. And personally, I think that we also have to bring more of this expertise of the IT markets into the trade arena because what's decided there, and you see it with these e-commerce chapters uh, trying to prohibit open source, etc., cetera, um, really requires some expertise and contemporary input from affected industries. No, yeah, I agree. I, one, one thing I wanted to point out, since you, this came up, no, in a way the difficulty that we have in Europe just, I mean, to in, encompass all languages, I, I really want to stress that, uh, in my opinion, this is also potentially a strength for the European internet industry. Because, I mean, uh, in general, maybe one of the reasons why, I mean, you, you know, people always ask, why don't we have a European Google, a European Microsoft, why Europe did not produce these very big internet platforms, so now, now we are depending on the American ones. I think Personally, this is also connected to the nature of Europe as, a, as an archipelago of 28 different states plus some others that are not even in the EU with different languages and different, actually still different markets. And, and, but in the end, uh, this model, the model based on interoperability and open standards is the model through which we can actually cooperate and create alliances between the naturally smaller companies in all these different countries. And uh, by the way, the fact that we have to cope with different languages and markets and ways and even low, still a certain amount of national laws is also what makes maybe the European technology more flexible and so easier to use in all the rest of the world. Since now the, the challenge is the, you know, the next billions of internet users which are not going to be in North America and in Europe and, but in, in the rest of the world and in which we'll have challenges about languages and scripts and, and national issues and whatever. So I, I do think that in general this is, I mean, what we are proposing is good in terms of principle and freedom and rights, and it's also good for business uh, for Europe. So strategically, it's something that fits uh, a lot the European model. And maybe the, 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 this is why, why we, I would expect Europe to be a little stronger towards the global players, because this is really the, uh, a requirement for the European industry to be able to compete with the global platforms. Yeah, any other initial thoughts uh, for this first set of uh, questions and ideas or just reactions? So then there's someone in the back waving, I think. Gonna walk to the back. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Leonid. I'm from Russia, but I work in Asia Pacific. I realized uh, from the very beginning that actually the topic was how to break uh, that oligopoly, if you mean. Uh, am I right? Yeah. So, and uh, I was a little bit. Uh, uh, flabbergasted that uh, the conversation actually took uh, a, li a little bit different twist which is uh, technical 
Uh, though from my perspective, this is a purely institutional problem. I witnessed uh, the rise of two different systems. One is, uh, let's say, the US, in the US, and the other one in uh, China. So both countries now boast uh, uh, the biggest internet companies in the world. Uh, by contrast, Europe uh, doesn't have a company which, uh, I mean an internet company, which would make it to top 10, does it? So the question is why? I mean, and I can address the audience. So why no European company has ever entered the top 10 uh, biggest internet companies in the world? And the reason is simple. The European legislation is so stringent that it effectively uh, you know, strangles uh, uh, those companies and cannot just let them go into that uh, area. Uh, uh, the US companies are big because they benefited from the original Silicon Valley uh, sentiment, which was all about less fair approach. You know, so there were no limits, no limitations, no uh, legislation in place to limit their growth. Once they became that big, uh, the government, of course, reacted and uh, not necessarily in a very positive way. In China, this is my speculation, the situation was a little bit different. Uh, because uh, those champions, be that Tencent or Alibaba, were mostly handpicked. So uh, they were effectively told, okay, so you will be leading the market, not him and not him, just you. And uh, that's how they uh, developed very quickly and uh, uh, how they bec became really big. And now it seems to me the question came, when we have two ecosystems, uh, then we have effectively no choice but follow uh, either uh, and uh, be their slaves, right? So the big question is how to return to that less fair approach which was practiced at the beginning and how to restore uh, the young generation of entrepreneurs' trust in uh, their ability uh, to develop something which would become uh, credible at the end of the day rather than sold off at the very early stage uh, of development to one of those big companies. And it seems to me the answer is, the answer lies, I reluctantly have to admit it, uh, with the governments. You know, there should be some kind of set of uh, measures which would return trust in those institutions which underpin a free market, uh, I mean, in that real sense of the word. Thank you. I guess maybe rephrasing, I think that uh, in, in what you're describing, it's a, right there in the middle kind of pops up the theme of interoperability as well. This is at least a, a, a context within which it's often discussed. So the idea is uh, Europe has, um, um, and this can of course be argued uh, between, um, uh, politically speaking, but Europe has, if we take an example of a regulation like the GDPR or earlier data protection rules, uh, a political decision essentially that, um, to simplify it greatly, that the big like data gathering business models are not going to be uh, promoted to the same extent in Europe. And at the same time, you also hear a lot of, let's say, European policymakers asking themselves, why don't we have these big data-based businesses? And there, of course, there are a lot of other factors, but the question then is, of course, not just directly framing it, is uh, we should just promote and go with a political setup that enabled these companies in the United States, where there's also now a lot of concerns about these business models, the ways that they were put forward. We are interested in looking at uh, interoperability as potentially that aspect in between, not picking one side, but instead promoting, let's say, um, a model, and this is, I think, back to Andre's point, it's interoperability in the technical sense to a large extent. I mean, a lot of it might happen through either open source communities or um, uh, standards bodies, depending on how uh, the actual technical solutions will be promoted. But there's also the political discussion that, you know, how do you promote this and push this forward so that uh, there's a way where perhaps we don't grow these massive companies, um, but instead we manage through interoperability and openness, network the many SMEs and universities and individuals. We have, I think Europe has, uh, between, we have more developers in Europe 
than we ha uh, than the U.S. has. So, like in terms of the 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 human capital, we have it. This is an alternative, perhaps, to unleash them. Uh, and find ways for them to compete. And this goes back to, I guess, something that's very popular in the EU bubble, like in the context of these, and like European values still to be defined, but. Uh, you know, several years ago, The Economist actually ran that question, why a no European company made it to, to uh, the top 10. And uh, they found an answer, I mean, they, them and I would uh, in some uh, in some way uh, agree with them. They found an answer in institutions, not uh, technical standards or inter interoperability. For example, they uh, examined the issue of uh, bankruptcy law in the United States and in Europe, and they found out that, for example, in the United States, if you go bankrupt, you can start a new company. Guess what? In a matter of days, in Europe. Uh, in France, it's like it takes up to 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. In uh, Germany, it's like uh, three or six years. I don't know. So there are no incentives for those young and talented developers to start it all over again after that market failure, right? So uh, if I believe that, yes, interoperability matters. But so are institutions, once again, which I understand following the classic uh, definition as uh, a set of formal and informal arrangements which are acceptable to the society and which can either benefit or be a penalty to that society if uh, they misused or uh, uh, if they are wrong essentially. Thank you. No, I, I take your point. Still, I mean, I, I, this is also why I think we should try to have some proper economic studies on, I mean, to understand whether these, these effects are actually true or not. Because I, I suspect that, that more than less efficient regulation, it, uh, the, the advantage from the US derives from the better availability of capital, especially. And, uh, and also, in the end, from a cultural aspect, and it's true to the, so the, the propension to risk, and this is true. Uh, still, maybe I'm, I'm an idealist, but I think that Europe should not try to copy the American model, uh, even in, in more in cultural and social terms. I think we, we have a different social model, which is maybe, yes, more attached to regulation in the public interest and to defending some social values, uh, and not just about I mean, making big companies uh, very quickly. Uh, I think the, the question for us Europeans is how do we keep that model and find a way to, to have it survive economically in this big clash between two other models, the American and the Chinese one. And uh, I, I mean, my take, I mean, again, I'm, I'm ready to discuss this with the people and also to have a look at proper scientific studies. But my take is that we need to defend our own market from the, the, these other models, which indeed are faster in bringing product, uh, products and are even better at closing them down and, closing, and capturing the market forever if, if we let them do, that, do this. So we have to find uh, w ways to resist this trend of, uh, by, uh, by these other social models to conquer us and allow the, the, our companies, our economy, our industry to grow in a slower but uh, different way which suits our social model, which is a cooperative way, uh, in, I mean, cooperation in difference in all these different uh, very maybe local ways that we have of existing as Europeans. And so it's, uh, I mean, this is why I'm still interested in trying out a different model. And I will point out that the, really the only thing that Europe has been doing in the last 10, 15 years that has left a mark globally over the internet is GDPR. So maybe that's just our talent. I mean, regulating maybe is Europe, Europe's talent. I, I'd start to suspect this. Yeah, I'm thinking. Uh, any other thoughts now? Uh, uh, because I you know, really also would like to investigate. Oh, yeah. Here in the front. Just. Just a quick one. Um, I, I'm thinking that um, interoperability um, is very much linked uh, to the simplicity of uh, the, the, the basic uh, uh, common uh, denominator that we have uh, among the applications that have to be interoperable. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying thing, uh, this, I was uh, uh, prompted by um, by the contribution of the colleague uh, uh, here. Uh, um, like, for instance, if we um, ask for some requirement for the script, uh, ASCII is, is basic and it's easy to, uh, um, uh, how can I say, um, uh, achieve interoperability if that is the, is the, the, the common, minimum, uh, uh, common 
uh, denominator that, that, that we ask for. If we start uh, using different scripts and so on, if you have the, the universal acceptance uh, as the, the basic uh, um, common uh, uh, area, this all becomes uh, incredibly uh, more complicated. In Europe, uh, we have, um, uh, we have some, th some things uh, that uh, if we want to be really perfect, uh, are, are problems that are um, very um, that have very difficult solutions. I, I remember many many years ago when I was a young programmer that I was given a simple task uh, that was uh, to sort uh, um, last names, uh, European last names. Uh, it was a big issue because of. Of course, the double L in, uh, in Spanish is a letter of itself, and so, I don't know, uh, uh, that, that are, that depending on whether you use uh, the Spanish uh, uh, collating sequence, uh, you have a certain order. If you use the Italian collating sequence, you have a different order. That, that there's no way to, to agree on, uh, uh, on which names comes before or after. So uh, uh, I think that uh, one of the, when, when we ask uh, about interoperability, this is not an abstract question where you can give a, a binary answer, yes, I'm in favor of interoperability or not. I think that uh, it has to be connected with uh, what is the set, the minimum set of requirements uh, that we want to have in common. And uh, in this, I think that the Americans are much more pragmatic than the European by having a, 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 a less complicated set of requirements, uh, they can achieve interoperability in, uh, uh, in a faster way. Uh, a really quick one. Um, first of all, European regulations are not that difficult to deal with. If your infrastructure company cannot deal with Article 30, the records of processing activities of the GDPR, run away because they will be a security nightmare. They will probably have servers running God knows what in the corner of the data center that nobody knows about until that they're you know, running DDoS attacks or something like that. So the, the GDPR um, is, is complex, but it's not the worst thing to come out of Europe. Um, in terms of a, a highly international um, community that does interoperability, that deals with localization, um, deals with all sorts of different characters, languages that, uh, you know, like Persian and, and Arabic that uh, present a challenge. Um, civil society is good at this. There's an NGO localization lab that does this for NGOs. Um, there are, you know, usability studies that are uh, geared towards the way people from different cultures use technology. Um, these civil society people are also running on very, very small budgets, and um, they're here. You know, find the people with colorful hair and lots of uh, stickers on their laptops and talk to them about how they do this on a minuscule budget. We can learn a lot from them. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, let's uh, move over a little bit, just um, uh, maybe, especially since we have uh, uh, such a diverse crowd, I would especially for us working with uh, open source and open standards, our crowds are often not as diverse as this, so that is something positive to begin with. Um, but uh, we also started looking a little bit at, you know, let's say the positive aspects, we really presented interoperability as, um, you know, we talked about the technical things, that there is a lot of possibilities, but also some challenges. But I guess also looking a little bit at different examples of uh, maybe non-IT markets. Um, I think the open banking example is very interesting where a, a kind of interoperability requirement um, has unleashed uh, kind of the, the fintech revolution, arguably, in, in London and the market that's happening there and the um, kind of the, the innovation that uh, Europe would like to see happening way more on our continent. Um, also, there are interoperability requirements uh, in the telco markets that have enabled a lot of new entrants into the markets and lower costs, etc. So thinking, you know, really opening up the, the, the floor and maybe opening a scene as a brainstorm, thinking apart from these examples, or if you know more about these examples, maybe develop a little bit. Um, but maybe if you can think of other, other examples where 
these kind of requirements put in place have actually led to a positive outcome, or for that matter, a negative outcome, if there are risks that we need to keep in mind. Is it on? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Basil. I am uh, from an organization named SFLC.in. Uh, it's short for Software Freedom Law Center India. So uh, I, I just just remembered, uh, carrying off from what you had said about usability, that um, um, we uh, go go around different events and and in, in, in one event. So I, I'm a lawyer and I also do digital security trainings. And uh, another digital security trainer came out and said, "Oh, free software doesn't look good." And second thing that she pointed out, uh, uh, a good example that, that we all need to be uh, aware of is access accessibility issues. So uh, they wanted to move to a very private and secure messaging uh, platform, but they had a person which, which, which had a disability. So, and, that it, and it was free software. So I've seen like a lot of uh, free software or a lot of open source software that's promoted uh, forget or do not work on that issue. So that's one thing that we all should look into. Any examples or ideas? Um, hi, I'm Jack. Uh, I'm from a small company called Assembly4. I think the only few examples I know of internet that have a good interoperability story is probably Mastodon, which is that uh, Twitter-like microblogging platform that uh, is a decentralized system where you can federate and talk to other instances. Um, that is unfortunately uh, one of the very few that exists that I think has a decent user experience. Um, as previously mentioned, um, a lot of open source software don't have fantastic user experience because good designers cost money and uh, open source tends to be pretty poor by comparison. Um, I don't know what a good way to make that better is apart from funding and that which probably comes from government grants and so forth, but uh, back in Australia, we, uh, we slash funding for various um, stuff like that because our government's not in a great place right now. Um, but Again, I think a lot of it stems from capital that people don't have. Uh, as for solving that problem, that's something that I don't know how to solve, but yeah. So down here in the front. Hi, I'm Herben. Uh, my background is all also mostly in technology. Uh, software, web standards, those kind of things. Um, I just wanted to make a small note here in the discussion. It, it sounds like there may be some uh, confusion with interoperable systems and open source systems. And it's been insinuated a bit, or at least it sounded as if like, oh, if it's an interoperable system, then we're talking about open source software. But I think open standard or interoperable systems and open source software are very different things. And the sad, the sad thing is that nowadays, most things that are made to interoperate and not lock, you, lock users into one type of software is coming from these open source, non-profit uh, systems, software projects. Um, but I think the whole point that we want to get towards here is to also get the commercial players to make their software in such a way that it can be interoperated with uh, by other software uh, creators. So requiring interoperability, because that's, that's the word is used here a lot, requiring interoperability, right? Um, if you do that, if you require interoperable software from also the commercial uh, players, then you can also make commercial things that may have a better UI and a funding model and like, May, it doesn't have to be open source software to be interoperable with other things. You can have a closed source Mastodon server. You can have a closed source Mastodon client, or Mastodon server would be ActivityPub server. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, I, th I think it's important to 
keep those things uh, separated. In no, I think that it's a very important point. Uh, I mean, also, you know, uh, open standards, I think, uh, and interoperability standards, be it in the form of, of let's say, um, the, the, the question then, uh, let's say, there are a bunch of standards already that um, are, you know, quite well placed to to uh, enable this uh, kind of uh, interoperability. Again, there are so many different layers where you could discuss this, um, and it's hard to really pinpoint it. Like if we're talking about, let's say, interoperability of something like um, app stores, that might we might have to look at different technical solutions. Um, uh, if we talk about instant messaging, I think is perhaps the easiest one to get your head around just thinking about it the first time. But there are other aspects here. There's also just generally speaking, um, together with the standards, you know, open source today doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, guarantee no lock-in. There are other sources of lock-in um, that are coming in place as well. And a lot of it, and this is something that was... Um, quite clearly pointed out by uh, Commissioner Vestager's report um, that came out, I think, January this year, where um, it's very you know, focused on the data aspects and data portability and data interoperability. Separating those two are also very important. But there is also a deeper question there where you know, when you start pushing it into um, a law or a, a solution, uh, if that's even what we want to do, if this would make sense. Uh, the concept of data ownership, I find, is very interesting, but it gets very complex as soon as you start thinking about four billion people owning their own data and then what that would look like in practice with these platforms. Not saying that it's impossible, really not making any strong statements on this, because I just think that it's very important to dissect these different topics and make sure that we're discussing about the right things. But from, from Open Forum Europe's point of view, how we usually see it as uh, there is almost like um, um, in promoting openness, there is this trinity of, uh, uh, you know, open source implemented through open standards together with uh, open data. And uh, all these three aspects are also interesting to, uh, to keep in mind when kind of uh, sorting through the in interoperability conversations because um, Europe and the EU might not be the fastest, you know, legislative body in the world. But they are quite eager to act. And uh, we have already seen um, especially regulations on the content layer, which uh, uh, might actually put us in a situation where you know, the original copyright directive, as it was proposed, would have been very problematic for collaborative software development, for example. Um, you also have aspects there where very few companies can actually um, perhaps meet those new requirements, being it through uh, filter requirements, for example. Um, here's a conversation uh, that right after it was quite, you know, popped up quite, um, uh, quite early after the copyright directive was, uh, uh, was voted through uh, to, to some, uh, it was quite controversial, but um, some people said essentially, well, okay, now if the EU has decided that we're gonna filter everything, let's at least make sure that those filters are free and open source software, because those filters, I mean, let's say you're a big company and you're the only one that actually sits on the technology that meets the requirements of the new law, um, you might be in a kind of filtering licensing mon monopoly position, which obviously is not good for competition either. So there's many different aspects that pop up, and I think it's very good that you pointed out those differences, because I think if we really take it down to the lowest level, it's standards that we're talking about, and it's open standards in this, this context. Okay, so Borislav Tadic, Deutsche Telekom. Yeah? I have uh, heard many interesting points uh, throughout the discussion so far. Uh, I would like to connect to a couple of those, um, um, a couple of those things said today. Number one is, uh, I believe, if we are looking how to define interoperability, I mean, we should start from the customer perspective, yeah? citizen user perspective. We should not leave it in the circle of academics, nor public sector, nor are us business people. Um, I would say it's important to ask if we have more than enough qualified experts and customers who can help us define what they would like to see as an operable, interoperable solution and what they want to migrate or have access to or um, uh, define in a way that we are trying to define it. And I think it's very easy also to gather and, and to get, uh, get now, especially to also through social media, which has been mentioned many times today, um, in a collaborative and crowd intelligence mode and, and gather those information and basically uh, in, in, implement them in, in, in our standards. Number two is uh, 
we mentioned uh, several times how to get to the open standards. If we look at the telecommunications industry I'm coming from, we have numerous very successful open standards which we started implementing years ago um, and they were all found out also on the principles of uh, of this multi like like it's popular today multi-stakeholder multilateral discussions and uh, I think this should be a good basis to start a discussion also in in, in, in this context I think also whoever plays in a certain domain yeah so uh, let's say if we are speaking now about the big five yeah the, the large OTT companies, they should follow the same rules. We have very clear rules about the information and communication, especially telecommunication here. And if someone is enabling messaging, then basically it should be also s same set of rules should apply to telecommunications operators and to the internet giants in this case. And we see that in examples of SMS, yeah, so or messaging, text messaging, that it is possible to establish open standards and it's also also possible to to um, make them a success in a, in a broader discussion and uh, I think it's very easy to to follow those things and so we are proud I mean from data telecom that inventor of SMS is one of our colleagues it, he, was, he received the German uh, uh, medal a couple of days back yeah uh, speaking about Europe lacking behind in 5g or AI or you name it you know I think I hear in the last especially in the last weeks at the conference is very much lots of negativity around that and honestly I'm not such a pessimist you know, when you look at the United States or China, for example, they were lacking behind in 3G several years. I think two years lacking behind in having the headsets and capabilities we had in Europe. So I don't think this situation is not reversible. I think we, we as Europeans can catch up, if not in 5G, maybe in 6G or in some other uh, technologies. It's important that we have uh, this mindset that we have to understand that the world is competing. And I also think the same thing applies to our uh, friends and colleagues, for example, in, in India or in any other region which, which is seeking for its breakthrough innovation. And I think we have a fantastic chances there as well. And maybe one of the other uh, points, uh, if we look at uh, basically uh, um, coming from the open standards into a, into a discussion, so we need to make really the discussion in a way that basically everyone is included and that we have a uh, clear, uh, clear path forward. And what I'm also noticing already in many of the forums uh, for the fifth, sixth, or seventh time is that we are often very long discussing the, the potential solutions instead of applying and iterating and uh, making sure that it's basically there. Why, I'm going to give you another example, near, narrow-based IoT. Yeah, if you know, the, it's basically a, a specific ways of communications uh, for the IoT devices based on the 4G networks currently. Uh, we could have discussed that for a very long time. However, there are two groups two very distinct groups of uh, uh, telecommunications companies which started with their partners to build such model. Yes, they are competing standards like MBIoT and LoRa. Yeah. However, one of them will win like it was in the past and uh, basically the other ones will apply, will, will adjust to this standard. So instead of, as I said, trying to make a full consensus from all, all the stakeholders uh, what, the, what the best standard would be and lose a couple of years, I think we should simply start with uh, start and gather the critical mass uh, of, of like-minded uh, organizations and I think start something and I'm sure if it's meaningful and if it's good that the others should join. Yeah? So that's my five cents. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, I also think that the telco is one of the environments which were both highly regulated and successful. So I think that it, it, it's an example we could follow. Especially, I mean, uh, I'm thinking of certain consultations now going on at the European level. I think we have to be careful that uh, we, we apply the same set of rules to for telcos and to what it is when they do the same things. Because today, it, it doesn't, it, it's not always like that. Um, yes. Um, one thing is um, in terms of how do we get where? How do we get to have interoperability viable and useful? Uh, I think one of the big hurdles that we face right now is that uh, a lot of companies, if they have personal data, they have a huge incentive of not sharing it, of not letting that go. Um, we have this incentive mostly right now because a, a very, very, very large chunk of what is happening on the internet is financed by advertising. Making money through advertising thrives on having the sole access to personal data. And the, we need to remove that. We need to remove the, the advertising business model. And that means as if you are an investor or you somehow are in the position of advising an investor, advise people to not invest into advertising money. 
into, not, not into advertising companies because those will not be interoperable. They have no interest in that. If you are a journalist, hype the companies that are not advertising companies and are not funded by those models. Hype the companies and write about the companies that have a, a non-advertising business model because those have an incentive or at least they don't have the incentive to not share the data. So there is at least the hope that they do that. If you are an end user and you look at your new, at your new service on the internet, if it is advertising funded, they will have no incentive to ever be interoperable. So go these things, uh, go these, wa these ways, look at those things, and then we will have co uh, an ecosystem of companies that at least is not hindered to be interoperable, and then they can start to do the right thing. Yeah, I wanted to also, pick, there are many things that are interesting to pick up on here, but your your point for, uh, about listening to, let's say, the customer or the user, um, could you develop that a little bit? I'm just thinking just purely practical. How would you uh, approach, because in, in, in our world, we're, you know, um, uh, one general challenge for us often is, uh, um, and I know many other organizations do this also, where you... Uh, you work for a, you know, a user perspective, um, but in terms of users in the broadest sense here, it's very difficult to essentially find them to get the input legitimacy into your efforts, uh, to have them represented. And I mean, this is kind of a big challenge for the EU generally of the multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, you want to have the customer or user represented, but the way the customer is uh, represented in the European context is through BIUK, uh, the European Co the Consumer Organization, which is set up and to a large extent funded by the European Commission because that solved the kind of... Um, that uh, collective action challenge, if one would put it as such. But I'm thinking, like, just how are you thinking practically in doing something like that? Because that would be a very interesting first step in approaching this, right? Sure. Uh, one example of uh, interoperability, or you mentioned, I think you mentioned uh, portability, or someone mentioned portability. Uh, we have in telecommunications area the, the the topic of number portability, yeah, and how. So 15 years ago we didn't have it, yeah, and then what happened is we spoke with the customers and. Of course, the consumer uh, protection industry, I mean, protection organizations were also talking to the customers, and customers said, you know, I'm annoyed. You know, whenever I want to change the operator, I'm going to lose all my contacts, all the people who have my number, you know, I'll have to send it out again. It was not so easy as today. Today, you can click with one click, you can basically uh, do that. So, basically, that's one example. What, how, what would be the parallel to the social networks? You know, maybe moving a username, alias, whatever, you know, you, you tell me. So, basically, something that's, that's basically easy and we need to speak with, with the people so to understand what would be important for them to be able to either use like an ideal case which I would very much support to use uh, when using one platform not being uh, needed to basically have 20 other accounts and 20 other apps on one phone I mean I'm also suffering from that if you ask me um, but I would say um, we have to uh, we simply have to speak with them. And yes, there is a way, like you mentioned, to speak through the representation, you know, like the representatives of the customers. But also, I think it's even better way to speak directly to them. You know, so in a smaller circle, it would be very, for the small companies, it would be, of course, talking to their neighbors and friends and colleagues. But for the bigger companies, such, uh, such for example, as, as we are, we, um, as we were considering changing of some of our company's policies or terms and conditions, you know, we were basically, uh, uh, we engage with the customer focus groups, which normally tell you, you know, this product is good, this product is bad, this, you know, that you should change the color here, and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We, sp we spoke with them exactly about those things. Instead of asking them, you know, what's the, what's the ideal life cycle of a product, we were asking them directly, for example, what do you, what do you find uh, negative or positive within our uh, terms and conditions? So they went through, uh, and uh, let's say, uh, um, some old lady from uh, some village uh, somewhere was telling us, you know, I'm, I cannot read this, this is a small caps. Some other uh, uh, mister from, from uh, a big city said, for example, I understand everything except this paragraph which uh, speaks about my data being processed in that and that way. So basically we simplified that and also came to a conclusion. So basically I think this conversation has to happen and I think there's many people in this room who have a good capacity to do that, you know, and, and access channels and uh, and basically when you gather those information, they will be a great starting point for, for the further discussion. 
Yeah, that may, may make me think that uh, perhaps uh, I, I couldn't agree more, but I think there is perhaps a, a, a yet another layer to it where um, if we take the example of like uh, uh, the end user or customers, or for that matter, citizens, uh, there is a concern um, from uh, consumer rights organizations about, let's say, the market concentration, for example, in the cloud market. And a lot of that market is B2B, but the fact is that the, the costs to society or the uh, consumer will be indirect in terms of higher costs further down the line. And um, that might, again, not knowing this, but I could see this being difficult. It becomes this kind of, uh, you ask a counterfactual question to, to let's say, consumers or users. Um, and it's like, well, if there was more competition, you would have a lower price, and of course you're happy with that, right? But um, that aspect of representation and going on to kind of different points in the stack and looking at market concentrations where, you know, I, one could also argue that, you know, looking at B2B cloud offerings and see what's happening in that market might be one of the key examples of like developments right now, both in policy, self-regulation, co-regulation, to see how, how um, different interoperability challenges or solutions could actually bring a better outcome. Because also there, obviously, depending on where you look at interoperability or data portability or switching costs, they are so different depending on where you are in the cloud stack. Uh, and here it's also very important to be um, quite sensitive in terms of what you would propose. Um, um, but if the other two options, and I guess this is one of our main points we mentioned in early on, if the other two options is just kind of monitoring and reporting on the societal costs of market concentration, and the other option and the other extreme would be to break up companies, maybe it's worth to take on the challenge of really working through the details and finding that kind of middle way. And that, that is perhaps more palatable uh, for, for, for politicians and policymakers as well. Um, back to the data portability aspect um, of, I guess, social, right? It seems a lot like number portability seems a lot more simple compared to moving a social account across, right? Like uh, you can back up your posts and all that stuff, but the comments, the relationships you have with other people on the platform. And ultimately, the biggest problem is social media customers have no leverage to make any of this happen, right? Like. Can someone go to Twitter or Instagram and be like, oh, hey, can you build me some portability stuff? And they're probably like, no, get lost. Like, consumers in the social media space, that, um, at the very least, have minimal power, right? Um, obviously, this is not uh, interoperability. Interoperability would be like, I guess, again, Mastodon and, and ActivityPub, where um, anything that supports ActivityPub can talk to other ones. But for the purposes of, I guess, End consumers and I guess uh, advertising based platforms, there is no incentive unless it's like regulation from the government to make that a, a possibility. And I just don't see an easy way forward for users to gain that power, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, data portability, let's say, is the first step towards interoperability in the sense that uh, it's true. I mean, full interoperability would allow you to ex move your data around uh, uh, in real time and exchange data with people outside of your system, while data portability only allows you to leave a, a, a supplier, a client that you don't like and go somewhere else. Uh, the, I wanted to point out that... Uh, First, uh, you do need uh, regulation for this because uh, no company will ever like to lose people to a competitor. And But even when regulatory re regulation is there, it's very hard to get these companies to actually implement it. And we're seeing this in Europe since now. I mean, Article 20 of the GDPR is in force since basically almost, uh, two years. And uh, basically, just after it, it, uh, the GDPR went into force uh, one year and a half ago, the, in the email space, all the big players, the big platforms announced a project we'll called the, the Data Transfer Project, which was meant to implement interoperability in uh, data portability for the email space. So, I mean, we, we are also an email company. We provide uh, the webmail platforms to a few big uh, European telcos, and so we, we really like this. So we went uh, to, to the mailing list for this effort and said, okay, you know, 
do you have an implementation on roadmap? So wh when will Gmail actually implement this so that we can sync on our side, make sure we are ready, and we will also implement this, and users will be able to use it from both sides? And we never got an answer to the questions. And one year and a half later, the mailing list is still there, and every now and then there's a Google developer posting a, an update, and uh, a new company says, yeah, we're going to do this, uh, but I've not seen any actual deployment of this. So it, for the moment, maybe this will change, maybe they will surprise me by I mean, actually putting it live into Gmail in three months or even three weeks. But uh, it looks more like uh, an effort to say, yeah, we are thinking of this, we're working on this, but not really doing it. And uh, so th this is why, I mean, I wanted to introduce one another issue, which is, I mean, in the past we were told that self-regulation is enough. I don't think this is enough. I, I've seen, especially in the inter in the internet space, especially I, even in very esteemed technical spaces like the ITF, a lot of discussion on things that would be good, but then they, they, these were never enough to make ch things change in practice, at least in, the, in, in this space. Then we we, are, we have regulation, but even regulation in itself is not enough. So the problem of, of this is that we actually need something very specific, I think, specific for each different type of application, so, I mean, maybe we can have a regulation with a very high level principle of uh, dominant platforms should be required to interoperate, but still we, then we need someone, something that can define practical and practically what that means for each type of application, which are the features that have to be interoperable, who is affected by the requirements and so, and, that is, and then we need enforcement. And this is also shown by the GDPR experience in itself, because uh, I mean the rules in the GDPR are not really new; are the same privacy rules that have been enforced since 1996. What changed uh, is the fines, <laughs> so the enforcement. And this was really the change that brought many uh, global players to finally implement European privacy laws. I saw that happen at ICANN, for example. So, the, so uh, I mean, the, this is why this discussion. I mean, it's nice to have the high-level discussion, but I wanted to also to hear your views, if you have or suggestions or whatever, on how can you bring this principle and then put it into some very practical uh, application that can actually uh, create effects in the real world, because that is going to be the difficult part. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just building a, a, on that, but I think we should also, um, I think the point that the gentleman in the front m made earlier is also very important to keep in mind that if there's one thing that companies are good at, it's responding to incentives. And if those are not in place, it will always be kind of an uphill battle. Um, I'm thinking of uh, also, I guess, building on, on, on the point that was made regarding social media and Mastodon and the idea of, like, let's say, a unique identifier and the challenges of exactly how to put something like that in place for data portability because, you know, the GDPR put in place requirements that data needed to be able to, you, you know, port it, to download your, your, your solutions. But since, arguably, the, the right incentives are not in place, what that looks like in practice is essentially you get... Um, you get a spreadsheet with a list of names of the contacts that you have on your social media account, which m you know met some lowest level maybe like uh, expectations of the requirements. Exactly where this is is now, I, I, I don't know. But the idea, though, to 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 extend our conversation to also talk about how to incentivize these companies to to actually take the full step and make it make sense for them, I think is very important. I think I saw a hand being raised in the back. Thank you. Um, Nicola Zingares from University of Leeds. I um, just wanted to raise a couple of issues uh, in relation to the the different types of implementation that we can have. Um, so I think that in order to restore some uh, level playing fields and competitive equality, what we need is um, a diverse approach to the remedies. So we should have a, a more stringent, more uh, significant obligations on the dominant players, and that was pointed out also at the beginning. So, but we need to th think about uh, really across the uh, chain of regulation, all types of remedies need to uh, reflect, I think, this principle. So when we are thinking about interoperability, maybe we might want to have a more um, wide-ranging type of connection, for example, uh, live access to an API uh, when it comes to the dominant players. And uh, I think that would be one uh, aspect. Another aspect is also with regard to the fines, you know, and um, 
uh, the kind of duty of uh, monitoring that needs to be in place for each of the platforms that are concerned. I think it, the more the platform is, uh, has a potential to affect uh, individual liberties, the more they should have this kind of uh, duties. But um, also with regard to uh, what's the purpose of uh, the remedy of interoperability of portability. I think that if we are talking about a user who has a specific uh, professional need, then the interoperability can be uh, framed or can be um, mandated in a way that helps that user to achieve that objectives. So uh, in certain cases, we might have a user who is, um, who is a journalist and might want to have access to uh, you know, certain sources of information, how Facebook, how did the, the platform was deriving certain data. And it's important in that case to uh, make the obligation so broad so that uh, that user can use uh, then um, basically uh, the sources in a way that serves the journalistic need. Whereas we had other users that just need to understand you know, why they were targeted with a particular ad and they might not need access to the same range of information. So I'm just wondering you know, if you are perhaps thinking about these different uh, implementations of interoperability to suit different needs and also different players to which this can be imposed. Yeah, I think generally um, the more, um, uh, you know, we've been digging into this space and listening to a lot of voices, uh, you know, this is the, 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 the point that it comes down to, that uh, there are a lot of different angles and depending on how you see it, you know, which perspective you, uh, you take, you can see it. There are many different, let's say, user or customer needs. That's one way of seeing it. More from a technical perspective, um, um, there will be uh, um, different solutions uh, that perhaps not should be prescribed specifically in a law because then you end up perhaps locking the technical, or, or the, locking the market to particular technical solutions now. And really, um, there are uh, sensitivities here and a, a multitude of, of challenges, but at the same time, and this is what I really want to stress, is that um, there's, it's, it, it will be important to keep on having those conversations and perhaps, this was a point made earlier also, in a particular area, it would be good to start perhaps putting something in place and then iterate based on that experience. Um, there have already been some laws put in place um, or proposed. Uh, there was one in the French Senate a few months back uh, which essentially touched on, on many of the, the points that we made here today where um, there's still quite a lot to wish for in terms of really specifying the aspects of how it would happen. There was essentially put, I'm, I'm a bit mean now to, to this legal proposal, but essentially it was said, we want interoperability, um, please, our regulator, can you just sort out what that means and how it should work? Um, but at least there are efforts be, being pushed. I think that was in the context of, of app stores specifically. Um, but perhaps uh, that, you know, we should take some steps in some areas to see how it would work and perhaps pick those based on where we see the biggest risks and the biggest sources of, let's say, uh, uh, be it net network effects based on data that exclude uh, new entrants to the markets or perhaps something else. But I. I it is to a large extent an open question and we've heard quite a lot of academics and professionals who have very strong positions on exactly what should be done and I think um, the more we're digging into it, we think that there is more complexity to it than, um, than that. Any other thoughts or... Well, in the meantime, while we have wait for the next intervention, I, will, I also will, will add that there are some newish concepts that are coming up, like the concept of device neutrality, which was also originally developed in Italy and then spread to several countries. And, and in a way, all this discussion interacts with neutrality discussions, or even network neutrality. So, uh, in, in some ways, uh, if sometimes the, the network neutrality concept, as it was designed like 20 years ago, it's now becoming counterproductive because it's uh, basically uh, this disadvantaging the European industry, which is mostly at the network level in comparison with the over the top industry, which is mostly global. And I mean, so it, it's still a valid concept, but uh, maybe uh, also that, that part of the discussion needs to be uh, re examined uh, under the light of the, of the new scenario. But yeah. 
Yeah, but if uh, let's see if there are no other, la oh, yeah, we have a point here. Yeah. Well, the mic is yeah, so we far have away. Like Fifteen minutes, but yeah. Otherwise, we can close early. And give you ten minutes. Also, yeah. We also have a question apparently from YouTube, so we can. Uh, do oh, that great! After. We, we didn't even know that we had remote viewers, so <laughs> thank you for following us. Anyway. Okay. Hi. Uh, just as a um, pointer on what to ask for or a question to ask is, if, is interoperability uh, serving the end user or potential competitors, the market, or some other player? Uh, that is something that really, especially if we put it into law, that really needs to be considered. Because if I say it has to serve the end user, it has to look, feel, work in a completely different way if I say it is to, to enable a more open market. Um, because then it works more behind the scenes for other things. It's more about, data st uh, about, about technical standards. But it doesn't need to have a fancy end user interface, for example. Um, I'm really on the fence of where we should put this. I tend to say to the end user, but it might be, make more sense to say it should be for the market and for future competition. Yeah, well, in theory, if, if you enable comp better competition, then you also get better services for the users, and that's... But yeah, I agree that uh, we, we have to be clear, because in some cases, there will be contrasts. But now I'm really curious about the yeah, YouTube you question. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to read it. I just have to walk back down to the end of the room. Okay, here we go. So we have from uh, Amali de Silva Mitchell. Is it possible to establish a decision free of values? For example, used for instance for showing relationships between languages like Euro-Asian heritage languages. That was a pretty complex question. Yeah. Wait, can you, can you ask it again? Yeah. Perhaps somebody in the room is m better positioned than yeah, me okay. to answer it. That was, okay, it's half an hour ago, so I think it's definitely for our session. I'll read it again. Is it possible to establish a decision tree of values? For example, used for instance for showing relationships between languages, like Euro-Asian heritage languages. It's more of a cultural language issue. Which is one part of the interoperability, as uh, Andre pointed out. Um, there's obviously, um, it, it also I guess not answering this question directly because I feel like I'm not personally in a place to do this, but uh, I think we should also keep in mind those other aspects. There's the technical uh, interoperability, let's say live access to an API, etc. But the, the language, um, language, cultural, legal uh, aspects of it are also very much part of the conversation and particularly in Europe. I mean, what is the EU but a big legal standardization process? Uh, <laughs> Um, and will be part, part of the conversation as well if we take the perspective of wanting to see, which is I guess another angle of looking at this also, uh, which is very much on the table, not just in Brussels, but also in other EU capitals. It's essentially what, how can we um, rethink the model so that uh, uh, Europe wants to compete better. If that is, you know, that is at least on the table for a lot of governments to really look at it from kind of an industrial policy point of view. Yeah, I, I'd say that, I mean, by definition, big platforms make money of uh, scale economies, scale economies. So they, they tend to make a product which goes more or less uh, fine with more or less the majority of people. So if you are someone who has a very specific need, for example, a very uh, minority language or a different cultural approach or you're a, a specific disadvantage group, then maybe having the ability to build your own application and still interoperate with everyone else gives you more possibility to express yourself and defend your values than just having to rely on the big platforms. Yeah, great. I have to say, uh, I think we're both very happy that there were so many people that wanted to contribute. We uh, were a bit worried that it was when we came in and saw it wasn't a round table that it would fall a bit flat. But thank you very much for all, all of your input. Are there any last ideas or suggestions? Um, yeah, also because think, I think, think we, I think we, we want to uh, follow up to this. So this was not just meant to be a one-off discussion. It was very interesting. Lots of things came up. We will go again through the list of the things that were said, but we would like to engage with people that actually want to contribute to this discussion. I think we have a window of opportunity in Europe since we have a new commission coming in, and there have been at least declarations that they really want to do something on this, in general on regulating the big platforms and making 
I mean, something to change the situation in Europe. And interoperability and so is very much the in the documents yeah. and strategies that are put for being put forward. So we, we would like to build a sort of civil society industry bottom-up uh, proposal coming out of this environment, mostly from the pro-open source uh, and uh, openness environment. And so everyone is welcome to participate. Uh, by the way, if you want to stay in touch, please uh, leave us our contacts. If we, if we don't know you already, we're... That we want to maybe build, we will build a mailing list or a, a way to continue the discussion. Yeah, please uh, come up if you're interested in continuing the conversation, exchange some business cards. Um, it is, as we said, a, a complex but very interesting conversation. And I think uh, um, this is one of the conversations, more broadly speaking, that the IGF is quite well suited for because uh, uh, here we have a diversity of voices that is quite often lacking in some technical. Um, uh, conferences or for that matter policy ones and here the two meet a bit more so um, yeah please come up and exchange cards that would be great and then we can uh, start to see where we can take this forward because you know I think everybody is agreeing that um, a lot of exchanges of ideas will be needed moving forward because if this is the strategy we decide to go go for if this is reasonable it needs to be very thought through and carefully designed okay Okay, thank you and thank you very much. You